evening. We are going to begin with the word of prayer before we have our song service. Uh, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege of being able to be here together. We ask in a special way that your Holy Spirit will be with us, that you will guide and direct um, this service. That may It may be a blessing not only to our own souls, but to those who are watching online. And Lord, I just pray that you will just prepare our hearts and minds for your soon coming. Help us, Lord, to be uh, transformed by your spirit, and that, Lord, we will be able to be a blessing to those in this community. And we just pray for your special guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, our first hymn, number 469, What a Fellowship. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Number 469. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all our alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning on Jesus, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning on Jesus, leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen, Amen. church. Amen. And because we are leaning on Jesus, we should take his name wherever we go. So we'll sing number 474. Take the name of Jesus with you. 474. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. Precious name, oh sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven, joy of Precious name, oh sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, Breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, joy of heaven. Precious name, oh sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Oh, the precious name. 
name of Jesus, how it trails our souls with joy. When his loving arms receive us, and his songs our tongues employ, precious name, oh sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, joy of heaven, oh, precious name, how oh, sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, at the name of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet. King of kings in hell will crown him when our journey is complete. Precious name, oh sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, joy of heaven, precious name, oh sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Amen. Please stand for our theme song. Our theme song, Without Him. Without Him. I could do nothing without him had surely failed without him I would be drifting like a ship without a sail Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Please don't turn him away, oh Jesus, my Jesus, without him. How lost I would be Without him I would be dying Without him I'd be enslaved And without him Life would be worthless but with Jesus, thank God I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Please don't turn him away, oh Jesus. My Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let me say good evening to everyone. Are you happy to be in God's house? Praise be the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are what? Safe. Praise God. This evening we want to welcome you here to our special revival and reformation. Revival and reformation. We trust and hope that you are enjoying Jesus and that you have been revived. As a result of revival, then there is ref reformation taking place. We want to welcome those who are online as well. And without any uh, delay, I think it's a good time to have our fellowship song. What do you say about that? I am so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Now, 
As I always said, if you don't believe that you're a part of the family, well, you really don't want to sing this one. But if you're a part of the family and you're happy, you know, some people are in some family and they're really not happy. Yeah, they're the, fa they're the family members, but they're not happy. But if you're a part of the family and you're happy, then join us as we sing this song, I'm so glad. Because if you're not, if you're not singing, and, uh, if you're saying you're not glad and you're not happy, then you're telling a lie. So if you're glad and you're happy, then let's stand and sing this song, all right? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in its fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel along. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, so reach out and touch. Yes, praise God. Somebody's and and make this church a better place. Yes, we can reach out and touch somebody's and. And make this church a better place. Yes, we can. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in His fountain. Cleansed by His blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel along i'm so glad i'm a part of the family of god praise the lord praise the lord you may be seated i'm so glad i'm a part of the family of god now we want to give god thanks because we have been enjoying the messages night after night we want to give thanks because God has been blessing us night after night. And this evening, God has special blessings for all of God's children. Those who are in the sanctuary, those who are online, those who will be listening to the message way after it is over. But today, we give God the praise and the honor and the glory. Now, tomorrow evening, there will be what? There will be no meeting. Tomorrow will be rest night. Tomorrow evening, there will be no meeting. And yes, we like when you are up front. We want you to come up front, come a little closer. The more we are together, the happier we shall be. For your friend is my friend, and my friend is your friend. And so we say, leave the back bench for the late comers. All right? Leave the back bench for the late comers. Some people say you must leave for the devil. We don't want no, we don't want, we don't want no devil inside here. So we leave in the, the back bench for the latecomers. The back bench for the latecomers. We give God thanks. Now, I know I, I, I don't want to disappoint anybody this evening. Some people feel disappointed when we don't collect any offerings. So we are not going to disappoint anybody this evening. So we are going to make sure we facilitate your giving. And so as the deacons come forward and you give your you return a love offering we are going to sing this song what song are we going to sing sister henry as um the lord is blessing me right now you know that one right all right the lord is blessing me right now and we can zell we the can lord zell. is blessing, blessing me right now right now oh the lord is blessing me Right now, right now, for he woke me up this morning, started me on my way. The Lord is blessing me right now. He's, he's blessing me, he's blessing me. He's blessing me over and over. He's blessing me, the Lord. 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 He's bless
is blessing me and you right now. Father in heaven, we thank you for that which you have provided for us. Lord, we want to return a portion of what you have given to us. We pray for your Holy Spirit to bless this offering, multiply its uses, so that souls in the sanctuary, souls uh, in this community, and souls who are online may be blessed as a result of us giving, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Night after night, friends, we have been blessed, not only with the presentations, but we have been blessed with the prayer. What do you say about that? And revival comes through reformation. And reformation, my brothers and sisters, and revival comes only through the Spirit of God. And one thing that we cannot do without we dare not venture about anywhere is without prayer. Spirit More of evangelism. Prayer. More power. Spirit of, evangel spirit of evangelism. And this evening we'll be praying for the spirit of evangelism. Now let me see the hands of those who love to evangelize. Speak the truth and stay in the church. All right. Evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. We are here. You are here. We are all here as a result of evangelism. And somebody else our our theme touch one more in 2024 touch one more and we are going to ask pastor blake to pray the special prayer if you my brothers and sisters uh, are inclined for missionary trying to do mission work we invite you to pray along with us as well as we sing this song Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and dread. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Father and our God. We turn to you at this moment because we have need. We have needs for thankfulness and needs that allow us to live our life. Oh God, please do something for us. You have blessed us already. You have given us life. You have given us opportunity. You have given us a new life. And we thank you for this. You have given us an opportunity to come to worship each night. To hear the evangelist. You have brought the evangelist and you have brought his wife here. Brought them safely. Inspired them every day to deliver a message to us. Dear God, for this and much more we thank you. We thank you for the era of evangelism whereby we are inspired to go and witness to people and tell them that Jesus loves them and Jesus is coming soon. Oh God, continue to put new spirit within us. Continue to revive our lives. Continue to reform our lives. Continue to do strange things in our lives. So that we, as we go forward from day to day, we can be sure that God is leading us. Yeah. You have covered the theme of the recovery of the last one. You have covered the theme of the saving of Israel after they have been released from captivity. You have covered many ideas under this theme. Tonight, we want to focus our attention on evangelism. We want you to inspire us again 
and help us to realize that this revival and this reformation is not just an exercise in futility, but it's an exercise geared to revive our life and to give us a new start again. We need this, girl, God. We need for everybody here to get up, rise up, and go forward. Amen. We need for everybody here to have a new spirit within them, a revived spirit in them, of love for their fellow man, of the sense of urgency of the time, for them to recognize that we are not set here to be spectators. We are not set here to be just dormant. We are set here as workers in the cause of God. So please, God, inspire every one of us who are bowed here. Inspire us to do what you have called us to do. Inspire us to be much different. There are people who are listening to us. They are not here. But dear God, you know their interests and you know their nature and you know their circumstances. Oh God, visit them, we pray. We pray. And touch them, we pray. we pray. Inspire them also, we pray. Revive and reform in their lives, we pray. And bring a new thing on this community. We are confident that you are aiming to Start a new revolution in this era. You have, you have set the evangelists here to tell us what we are to do. Inspire us to obey your will and to do what you say. Tonight we are waiting again to hear more from your word. Inspire your man servant. Touch him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. May he speak as never before. May he speak as a man who has been touched by the Holy Spirit. Yes. May he speak as a man who has been revived by the Holy Spirit. May he speak as a man who has a mission to tell us what to do. Oh God, inspire us and teach us new things we pray as we wait upon thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, church family. Amen. Amen. Uh, how's everybody doing this evening? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, just a quick little caveat again. Um, did everybody receive their right card yesterday? Did everybody get a right card yesterday? So you certainly do not want to leave here this evening without getting a right card. We'll make them available after the, uh, after the message is over this evening. Now, has everybody been to the, um, to the book stand? Has everybody been to the book stand? All right, uh, some of us, uh, maybe not all of us. Well, this uh, particular evening is very special uh, because we are giving a reward for this, uh, for this uh, question and answer. And so you certainly want to pay attention uh, for whoever gets a 100% on our quiz. <laughs> Uh, this evening, we'll receive not only a free book, uh, but also a free Cara bar. And so that is something you certainly want to uh, pay attention to. Uh, but before we begin uh, with that, I'm just going to say a word of prayer and we will get started. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this uh, evening. We thank you so much for Wednesday night prayer meeting. We pray that your spirit may be with us. Dear Lord, and as we go over this question and answer, uh, we pray that it be a savor of life into life. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Now, does everybody remember what was the subject matter for yesterday evening? 
education. So we talked about the importance of education. The importance of education. All right, question number one. Question number one. All right. Yeah, so question number one, it says, what is education? What is education? What is education? What is education? All right, I'm just going to blank this out until we're done with the quiz. All right. All right, question number two. What man of God was used to make the iron swim? What man of God was used to make the iron swim? What man of God was used to make the iron swim? Question number three. Name five subjects taught in the schools of the prophets according to A.T. Jones. Name five subjects taught in the schools of the prophets according to A.T. Jones. Name five subjects taught in the schools of the prophets according to A.T. Jones. Uh, did everybody get that one? All right, amen. All right, question number four. It says, what was the name of the Jewish convert to seven-day Adventism who wrote an article in the 1930s describing why the Jews rejected Jesus or rejected Christ? Again, the question was, what was the name of the Jewish convert to seven-day Adventism who wrote an article in the 1930s describing why the Jews rejected Christ? <laughs> yes. All right. What did the, uh, what, uh, why did the Jews reject Jesus? According to that same article, why did the Jews reject Jesus? Why did the Jews reject Jesus? All right, question number six. Where does the education of the child begin? Where does the education of the child begin? Okay, uh, did everybody get that question? All right, uh, question number seven. What two subjects should children learn regarding the maintaining of their body? What two subjects should children learn regarding the maintaining of their body? What two subjects should children learn regarding the maintaining of their body? All right, question number eight. It says, what was the name of the Catholic convert to Christianity that wrote of the dangers of Catholic education? What was the name of the Catholic convert to Christianity that wrote on the dangers of Catholic education? Uh, did everybody get that? <laughs> All right, we have two more, 10 questions in total. Question number nine. What science must we understand so that we may have a place in the kingdom of God? What science must we understand so that we may have a place in the kingdom of God? All right, say one more time. What science must we understand so that we may have a place in the kingdom of God? And question number 10, our last one, it says, according to Christ Object Lessons, what is one of the main reasons why children become infidels and skeptics? According to Christ Object Lessons, what is one of the main reasons why children become infidels and skeptics? Infidels and skeptics. All right, did, uh, did everybody get that question? All right, we'll start back from the beginning. Now, who, by show of hands, believes that they got 100%? <laughs> you see, this is, this is one of the great incentives for actually paying attention, for paying attention very, very assiduously. All right, question number one, it says, what is education? 
Yes, character development. Question number two. What man of God was used to make the iron swim? Elisha, yes. Name five subjects taught in the schools of the prophets according to A.T. Jones. Music. Music. Poetry. Poetry. History. History, yes. Math of some sorts, okay. Science. Numbers. Numbers. Prayer. Prayer, okay. Hygiene. Hygiene, physiology. Yeah, so if you were to na- uh, if you were able to name at least five subjects, you got that you got that correct. All right, question number 4. What was the name of the Jewish convert to Seventh-day Adventism who wrote an article in the 1930s describing why the Jews rejected Christ? F.C. Gilbert. Yes, F.C. Gilbert. F.C. Gilbert. Did anybody remember that man's name? F.C. Gilbert? Oh. <laughs> Okay, somebody says not at all. Question number five. What, why did the Jews reject Jesus? Because they were educated by the Greek philosophy. Okay, yes. As a result of false education. As a result of false education. All right, question number six. Where does the education of the child begin? In the home. All right, question number seven. What two subjects should children learn regarding the maintaining of their body? Yes, anatomy, physiology, and there's also another one. Hygiene, yes, physiology and hygiene. Question number eight. What was the name of the Catholic convert to Christianity that wrote of the dangers of Catholic education? Charles Chinnikwe. Did anybody get Charles Chinnikwe? All right. (laughs) Question number nine. What science must we understand so that we may have a place in the kingdom of God? Not prayer and faith. It's a good answer. The science of education, the true science of education. All right, question number 10. According to Christ's object lessons, what is one of the main reasons why children become infidels and skeptics? Yes, the poison of gossip. So parents, we come home, and as a result of the gossip that we communicate at home, the children are educated in infidelity and skepticism. All right, again, by show of hands, who here got 100%? All right, uh, by show of hands, who here got 90%? Okay, one soul. By show of hands, who here got 80%? Who here got 80%? By show of hands, who here got 70%? Okay, we have, we have two that got, what, is it three that got 70%? Okay, two, is it just two? Just two? All right, so our dear brothers, you all will get a free book and a carob bar. A free book and a carob bar. Amen? Amen. I'll say it again. Well, you're married to the, to the evangelist, so. <laughs> yes. All right, so without further ado, we're going to uh, have a word of prayer, and by God's grace, we will begin. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this Wednesday night prayer meeting. I thank you, dear Father, personally, on behalf of my family here, for the messages that you have been communicating to us. Lord, I pray that you would really help us to take heed. As we are genuinely seeking revival and reformation, dear Father, I just pray that you, that you would please forgive us of our errors and backslidings. I pray, dear Lord, that you would be with us this evening as we study these all-important subjects. I pray that you would enlighten and illumine our minds, be with our online audience in a very special way. I pray, dear Father, that you would please be with my mind and my heart. Lord, that you would please calm, uh, call me so that this message may be communicated properly. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Now, in light of that, let's open up our Bibles to the book. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Psalms. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Psalms. Yes. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 51. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 51, and let's notice what the Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 51. Psalms, chapter 51, let's notice what the Bible, what the Bible says. Now, we have been going over this two-week series of revival and reformation, and God has been communicating things that are, that are of very vital consequence to our eternal soul salvation. Now, in light of that, in Psalms, chapter 51... Before we get into the message for this evening, uh, Psalm chapter 51, starting in verse number 7. So as I'm pretty sure we all know to a greater or less degree, David is writing this after his great apostasy with Bathsheba and his killing of Uriah and his subsequent tent attempt to cover his iniquity. Now, Psalm chapter 51, starting in verse 7, the Bible says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be... I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear, the, hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit where? Within me. It says, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit where? And take not thy Holy Spirit, because when we sin, by default, we have forfeited our right to have the Holy Spirit. Verse 12, it says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. It says, Deliver me from, from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. So as a result of David going through this experience, this was sincere repentance to which he was manifesting. And this was actually one of the things that God was impressing on my mind, even as I was preparing for uh, this, e this evening's message is that when we truly have a proper sense of our standing as sinners, as guilty before God, this will make us actually appreciate more the great salvation that has been given to us. When we understand this properly, this will actually lead us to more sincere repentance. Because even though very many times we may you know, say, you know, Lord, forgive me for the sins that I've committed, we really don't have a proper sense of the reality of what sin is. And as a result of that, that is the reason why we continually fall in these same sins again and again and again and again. Now, in light of that, as we take a look at our screen, notice this, notice this. Now, does everybody see this here on the screen? This is a symbol of the heart, but really a symbol of the mind. This is, a, this is an artist's rendition of the experience of conversion. Now, we went over this a couple nights ago. What does the dove represent? Yes, so the dove represents the ministration of the Holy Spirit, especially as he is working upon the human heart in the process of conversion. Notice this. This is taken from the book, The Great Controversy. Now, who here, by show of hands, has heard or read and studied the book, Great Controversy? All right, now there is a very powerful chapter in that book called Modern Revivals. I would encourage every person to go through that chapter. Notice, this says revivals brought a deep searching, deep heart searching and humility. This is talking about the great spiritual revivals of the past. They were characterized by solemn, earnest appeals to the sinner by yearning compassion for the purchase of the blood of Christ. Men and women prayed and wrestled with God for the salvation of what? For the salvation of souls. This says, the fruits of such revivals were seen in souls who shrank not at self-denial and what? So when we are properly converted, we will not shrink 
at self-denial and sacrifice. Now, if we have great issues with this reality, this may be a great indication that we have not been thoroughly converted. This says, but rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer reproach and trial for the sake of Christ. Men and women, it says, men beheld a transformation in the lives of those who had professed the name of Jesus. The community was benefited by their what? This says that the community was benefited by their influence. So if there is genuine revival and reformation taking place in a church or community, it will be manifested by genuine evangelism. So if there is not genuine evangelism taking place, this means that there is not proper revival and reformation. Does that make sense? This says they gathered with Christ and sowed to the Spirit to reap life everlasting. This says popular revivals, notice, popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the what? To the imagination. By exciting the emotion. So again, in, in very many of the great revival and, and so-called reformations of this day and age, the great attraction in these revivals tends to be the music. And if the music is, is, is eccentric enough, we believe that this is great evidence that the Holy Spirit has been present at the meetings. Now, this is a question. Did Jesus need to bring down Kirk Franklin to sing before he preached the Sermon at the Mount in order to bring the multitudes unto him? Did Jesus need to bring down um, Hezekiah Walker in order to sing before the masses in order to ensure that he would have a congregation? So why is it that we feel that we need to do all of these things in order to give a, a, uh, a catalyst for the preaching of the gospel? This says, by exciting the emotions, by, gratif by gratifying the love for what is new and startling. Converts thus gain have little desire to listen to Bible truth. And again, in very many of these revi revivals, deep-seated Bible truth is not being communicated. Little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. Unless a religious service has something of a sensational character, it has no attractions for them. Even to the point that we feel as though that if we can put on plays, if we can get a tank to run through the church, that this is somehow going to make the church service more attractive. And those examples that I just gave are not exaggerations. These are some of the things that current, that current churches are doing literally thinking that this is going to bring in converts. This says a message which appeals to unimpassioned reason awakens no response. Again, Satan has created a generation of us as Christians, especially as Seventh-day Adventists, that we have gotten to this place where taxing our minds in studying the Word of God is something to which we are not accustomed to doing. So as a result of that, many ministers get up and they may read just one text in the entire sermon and the rest of it is just them giving their own opinions. This says a message which uh, appeals to unimpassioned reason awakes no response. The plain warnings of God's word relating directly to their eternal interests are unheeded. Now in light of this, do you think that we need true revival or fake revival? We need true revival and reformation. Revival and reformation. And in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. This is the text to which we have been reading daily, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice what the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to start in verse number 10. It says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples. And again, what does that word ensamples mean? Yes, this means examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. This says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 
It says, There had no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to do what? To escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, what group of people was the Apostle Paul referring to when he wrote this statement? Yes, the ancient Hebrews. Now, in light of that, this is uh, our uh, theme passage that we've been going over this entire Revival and Reformation series. This, again, is a symbol of that mass exodus from the Medo-Persian realm after the 70 years of captivity. After the 70 years of captivity. This says, many are casting contempt upon the Old Testament scriptures, but these are not to lose their sacredness throughout all time, They are not to be dropped out of our instruction. The prophets spoke less for their own time than for the ages which have followed and for our what? And for our own day. So this is saying that these prophets of the past spoke primarily for our time than for their time. Now, over this past week and a half, we've been going through many of the principles that led directly to their captivity in Babylon. We've gone over principles of the home. We've gone over principles of paganism, false education, all of these things. Now we are going to see some of the experiences that were directly linked to them leaving Babylon. Now, do you think that that's something important for us to understand? Yes, it is. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Daniel. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 9. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 9. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse number 1. Daniel chapter 9, we're going to read in verse number 1. Daniel chapter 9, let's notice what the Bible says, starting in verse 1. It says, In the first year of Darius the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the what? So Daniel the prophet was reading the writings of Jeremiah the prophet. It says that he would accomplish how many years? Seventy years in the desolations of where? Of Jerusalem. So as a result of Daniel coming to the realization that this 70 years captivity was coming to an end, Daniel earnestly started to seek the Lord for divine revelation. So in verse 3, it says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and what? Sackcloth and ashes. So again, As a result of Daniel realizing that this captivity was coming to an end, he was earnestly seeking the Lord. Now, are we living in a day day and age where Bible prophecy is being fast fulfilled? Yes, we are. So in light of that, that means that we should be earnestly seeking the Lord for divine revelation. We shouldn't just be passively seeing the signs of the times. We should be earnestly seeking the Lord for an understanding as to what we ought to do. Now, does that make sense? All right. Now, in light of that, take a look at this. Now, does everybody see this? Now, when the Jews were leaving uh, that Babylonian, that Medo-Persian captivity, what, where were they going back to? Where were they going back to? They were going back to Jerusalem. In light of that, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezra. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezra. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6, and we're going to read in verse 14. Ezra chapter 6 in verse 14. Ezra chapter 6 in verse 14. And when you have it, you can say amen. Amen. The Bible says, And the elders of the Jews build it, and they prosper through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they build it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius 
and Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes king of what? And Artaxerxes king of Persia. So as this 70 years captivity was coming to an end, God moved upon these, these ancient monarchs in order to enact decrees so that Israel could go back and build their ancient homeland. Does that make sense? All right. Now, this is a symbol of the second temple that was built. Some persons call this Zerubbabel's temple. Again, this is an artist's rendition of this second temple that was built in place of the first. Now, who was responsible for helping to lead in the construction of the first temple? Solomon, yes, Solomon. And that's, that's unfortunately one of the reasons why that temple is called Solomon's Temple. But we know that as a result of their apostasy, that first temple was unfortunately destroyed. It was unfortunately destroyed. All right, now this is a gentleman by the name of M.L. Andreasen. Notice what he says about this sanctuary service just in general. This says, a study of the Old Testament regulations concerning the manner of approaching God will pay rich dividends. In the sacrificial system are found the fundamental principles of godliness and what? And holiness, which find their complete fulfillment in who? In Christ. One of the great uh, mechanisms and great understandings that even brought the Seventh-day Adventist church into existence was our pioneers' study, their diligent study of the Old Testament especially as it pertained to the sanctuary service. Because some have not mastered these fundamental lessons, they are unable and unprepared to go on to the deeper things prepared for them of God. The Old Testament is what? Again, when Jesus said, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life, was he talking about Matthew through Revelation? No, he was talking about Genesis to Malachi, yes. He who is thoroughly grounded in it will be enabled to construct a superstructure that will not fall when the rains descend and the winds blow. All right, this says the splendor of Solomon's temple can be seen from the spoil which Nebuchadnezzar took from Jerusalem. An enumeration in Ezra gives 30 chargers of gold and a thousand chargers of silver and nine and twenty knives, thirty basins of gold. Is that a lot of gold and silver? Yes, it is. That's a lot. Silver basins of a second sword, 410, and other vessels of a thousand. Notice, of the second temple, it says, Josephus likens it to a snow-covered mountain. So even though this wasn't as grandiose as the first temple, it was still beautiful. But did God especially prophesy that something special was going to happen to the second temple? Did the Bible prophesy about that? Yes. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Haggai. Haggai, one of the books of the Bible to which we do not read very often. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Haggai. Haggai. Haggai chapter 2. Let's notice what the Bible says in Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Again, we're getting an understanding of what the ancient Hebrews actually went to go do after they were led out of captivity. Haggai chapter 2, starting in verse number 1. The Bible says, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, governor of Judea, of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do ye see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as what? And the Bible even describes that when the uh, ancient men saw the foundation being laid for the second temple, does the Bible say that they greatly rejoiced? No, the Bible says that they wept because they saw the grandeur of Solomon's temple, and they were so sad in seeing the fact that the, that the second temple was unfortunately so inferior. Now, do you think that there is any correlation between that experience and us in this day and age? 
Yes. I wish we had a lot of time to go more through Adventist history. But verse number four, it says, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, O ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and, uh, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt. So my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all what? I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall do what? Shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than, greater than of the former. Saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now when the Bible says the desire of all nations, what is, what is God referring to? He's referring to Christ. Now does everybody see this picture? Now, does this dear gentleman, does he look very happy? This is unfortunately a symbol of the condition that humanity was in and is still currently in, but especially at that time, the condition that humanity was in right before the first coming of Jesus Christ. Man was in complete and utter despair. Humanity was crying out for a Messiah. It wasn't just the Jewish nation. But the entire world was crying out for deliverance. And as a result of that, the Bible says what we just read in Haggai chapter 2, that this desire of all nations that the Messiah was actually going to be manifested in the second temple. In the second temple. Now notice this. We're getting to a point. This is from Desire of Ages. This says, as the Jews had departed from God, faith had grown dim, and hope had well nigh ceased to illuminate the what? The future, it says, the words of the prophets were uncomprehended. So even though the Jews had the prophecies before them, they had no idea what they meant. Now, do you think that we as Seventh-day Adventists, even in this generation, are in the same condition? We have all of these prophecies of the word of God, but unfortunately, the vast majority of us have absolutely no idea what they are referring to. This says, to the masses of the people, death was a dread mystery. Beyond was uncertainty and gloom. It was not alone the wailing of the mothers of Bethlehem, but the cry from the great heart of humanity that was born to the prophet across the centuries. The voice heard in where? In Ramah. Actually, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read this. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 18. So this is after Herod had uh, gave that decree to destroy the, the firstborn uh, young uh, boys. Or the firstborn children. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2 starting in verse 18. The Bible says in Ramah. Actually, we'll start in verse 17 just for the sake of context. It says, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are what? Because they are not. We're told in Desire of Ages that as the Godhead looked upon this planet, they saw human beings that were being corrupted, murdered, and loss, literally millions of persons practicing false religions, leading them to destruction. Now, again, are we living in that same state of affairs in this present generation? There are millions upon millions of people around the world, even in this very state of Florida, that are practicing false religions, that are leading them directly to sin and Satan. And the question is, what is being done to enlighten them? Out of this darkness. 
Now, in light of that, it says, In the region and shadow of death, men sat on solace with longing eyes. They looked for the coming of the what? Of the deliverer. When the darkness should be dispelled and the mystery of the, of the future should be made plain. Now, in light of that, what does it say on the screen? This says Ezra. Let's turn in our Bibles back to the book of Ezra. Now, in light of the experience that these ancient Hebrews had as they were making their migration back to Jerusalem, do you think that there are any lessons to be learned from the experience of Ezra? Yes. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezra chapter 7. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezra in chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7, we're going to start in... Verse number 6. Ezra chapter 7, we're going to start in verse 6. The Bible says, This Ezra rent up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all his request, according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. Verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart, to seek the law of who? To seek the law of the Lord. Notice, to do it and to teach Israel statutes and, and judgments. As we talk about revival and reformation, we need to desperately pray for the spirit of Ezra. And again, notice what the Bible said. It says in verse 10, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the what? So before we even seek to invest ourselves in studying the sacred teachings of the Bible, of the spirit of prophecy, we need to pray that God will actually prepare our hearts to even understand the things that we need to comprehend. Does that make sense? You know, the great reformer Martin Luther during the uh, dark Middle Ages, he, uh, he was on record as saying that prayer is the better half of study. One of the great reasons why we don't get very much out of studying the word of God is because we're not diligently praying. It says, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach Israel in statutes and what? So was he merely studying the word of God merely to have head knowledge? So the Bible says that he was not only studying the word of God diligently, but he was also earnestly seeking to practice it. Again, he was not only making diligent effort to understand the will of God, but he was seeking to practice that which he understood. And it says to teach Israel statutes and judgments. So when we study the word of God diligently and we're seeking to practice it, it's not just for us, but God is trying to equip us so that we can teach others to do the same exact thing. Now, in light of that, again, this is a symbol of Ezra, a symbol of Ezra. Now, as the Bible says that Ezra was a ready scribe in the law of God, and he was doing all of these amazing things, but we're going to jump down a few chapters over, and we're going to notice something very peculiar about the experience of Ezra. And this is a peculiarity that has always marked the men and women that God has used over the history of salvation. Notice, Ezra chapter 9, starting in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, this is, this is Ezra speaking of himself. The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations. Notice, even of the Canaanites, and again, were the Canaanites devout followers of the God of heaven? And the Hittites, were the, Hitt were the Hittites faithful? And the Perizzites, were they faithful? 
the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Again, have we talked about the influence of having an improper home? Yes, and unfortunately, even in this day and age, there are many of us, even as Seventh-day Adventists, that are still trying to make crying excuses for marrying people not of our faith. It says, Mingle themselves with the people of those lands, yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. So this is saying that those that were chief in the transgression weren't merely the common people, but it was those in positions of spiritual responsibility. It says, And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening what? Until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I, ar I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. Notice what Ezra said in his address, in his address towards God and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face unto what? So do you think that Ezra was manifesting humility? Yes. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the what? Unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to the captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is what? This day, we're going to jump down to verse 13. Notice what the Bible says. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds, for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities, what? Again, it is by the mercy of God that we are not consumed. Even of the punishments that we have received, this has still been much less than what we really deserved. You see, brothers and sisters, if we are really going to engage in revival and reformation, like many of these ancient patriarchs and prophets, we need to learn how to intercede with God. We need to learn how to intercede with God. And in light of that, when you see this picture, what comes to your imagination? Prayer. Do you think that we need to learn the science of prayer? Do you think that we need to learn and to study its principles? Yes. Yes, we do. Now, who here has heard of a book called Steps to Christ? Steps to Christ. This is a book that I would highly encourage everyone to go through again and again and again and again. Number one, there are certain conditions upon which, may we, upon which we may expect that God will hear and answer our prayers. One of the first of these is that we feel our need of what? That we feel our need of help from him. Now, do you think that Ezra felt his need of divine guidance? Yes, he did. Because if we don't feel our need of God, are we going to have an incentive to actually get on our knees and pray? No, we will not. He has promised, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, who long after God, may be sure that they will be what? Now, to our natural carnal hearts, do we love to long for righteousness and holiness? No, we don't. You see, this is actually a, a virtue of Christian grace that we actually have to pray for. We need to pray that God will implant in our hearts supernaturally a desire to want to spend time with him. Because naturally, as human beings, we don't want to spend time with God. The Bible makes it very clear that the carnal heart 
that it is enmity against the law of God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. All right, number two. Now, again, what was the first point that we just went over as it pertains to prayer and, and, and effectual uh, perseverance with God? Fill our need of prayer. Fill our need of God. Point number two, it says, if we regard iniquity in our hearts, if we cling to any what? Any known sin, the Lord will hear us. He will not. But the prayer of the penitent contrite soul is always accepted. When all known wrongs are righted, I'll read it again. When all known wrongs are righted, we may believe that God will answer our petitions. Our own merit will never commend us to the favor of God. It is the worthiness of Jesus that will do what? It doesn't matter if we stop sinning this very day and lived a life of complete holiness for the rest of our lives. The fact that we have been sinners will always call for our need of having a substitute. And as a result of that, there is no good work that we can cry out to that will recommend us to God in our effectual and fervent prayer. The only reason why our prayers have any merit before God is as a result of Christ and him crucified. That is the only thing that recommends us to God. It says, his blood that will cleanse us, yet we have a work to do in complying with the conditions of what? Of acceptance. So again, what is the second point of having effectual prayer when it comes to God? We have to put away sin. We have to put away sin because again, is sin offensive to God? Now, when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, what was oppressing his soul? The weight of sin. Now, was sin, re was sin really pressing upon the heart of God, upon the heart of Christ? How was sin oppressing the heart of Christ? C could you literally see the sin pressing upon his soul? So how was the sin oppressing the soul of Christ? <laughs> you see, because Jesus took the sins of humanity upon him, by faith. <laughs> Jesus took the sins of humanity upon him by faith. And as he was taking those sins upon him, the, the realization of the guilt of transgression was so oppressing his soul that the Bible says that he started to sweat great drops of what? Blood. It was blood that, was, that were literally bursting from his pores as a result of the mental agony that he was going through. Now, we're told in Desire of Ages, the Bible brings out this principle as well, that God the Father was withdrawing his beams of light from God the Son. And we're told that if we could have actually seen that reality, we would actually understand even more how offensive in God's sight is sin. So when we have the audacity to get down on our knees and pray, and we know intellectually and spiritually that there is sin in our life that we are not willing to give up, our sin is literally going no higher than the ceiling. Yes, prayer. All right, uh, point number three, it says another element of prevailing prayer is what? Is faith. Now, have we talked about faith before? Yes. This says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that passively seek him. Diligent. Again, what does it mean to be diligent? Yes, earnest application. Earnest application. This says, Jesus said to his disciples, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall do what? Do we take him at his... At his word. So we need faith in order to effectually pray with the Lord. We need faith in order to effectually have prayer with our Lord and Savior. All right. Point number four. It says perseverance in prayer has been made a condition of what? A condition of receiving. We must always, we must pray always if we would grow in faith and experience. 
Now, in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book, book of Luke. We're going to read in chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. We're going to start in verse number 1. Luke chapter 11. We're going to start in verse number 1 as we seek to bring this to a close. Luke chapter 1. We're going to start in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, deliver us from evil. Verse 5, it says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, notice, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he what? As he needeth. So as the disciples came to Christ, asking him for instruction as it pertained to the principles of prayer, one of the most important examples that he gave to those disciples was this aspect of importunity. Now, what does it mean to be importunate? Yes, just perseverance, persistence. So the Bible is saying is that if we're going to have effectual prayer, we need to be persistent in prayer, persistent in prayer. It says, In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. It says, Praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. Notice, keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before God. You cannot do what? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? And one of the great uh, deceptions that Satan tries to put in our mind is that God will actually become weary with us constantly going to him with all of our problems. Now, don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters. We need to learn how to actually commune and have relationship with him. But the reason why God is who he is, who he is, is because he can handle our sorrow. Because if we try to handle our sorrow, what is that sorrow going to do to us? It's literally going to kill us. Did it kill Jesus? Yes, it did. Now, did Jesus die because a spear was thrust into his side? Did Jesus die because he got a cat of nine tails almost 80 times? Did Jesus die because he was uh, spat in the face and, and, the, and the hair was ripped out of his beard? Is that why he died? Jesus died of a broken heart. And as a result of that mental oppression that was encapsulating his soul, his heart literally burst. His heart literally burst. And as a result of that, Desire of Ages even says that because his mental agony was so intense that his physical pain was hardly felt. It was hardly felt. It says, take to him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear. For he upholds worlds. He rules over all the affairs of the universe. There is a very beautiful passage in the book, Ministry of Healing. And it says that above the distractions of the earth, that God sits enthroned. That all things are open to his divine survey. And that from his great and calm eternity, that he orders that which his providence sees best. It says, no calamity can befall the least of his children, no anxiety harass the soul, no joy cheer, no sincere prayer escape the lips 
of which our Heavenly Father is unobservant. All right. This says, Our Heavenly Father awaits, waits to bestow upon us the fullness of His blessing. It is our privilege to drink largely at the fountain of boundless hatred. The fountain of boundless love. What a wonder is it that we pray so little. Again, in light of this great privilege that has been given to us as human beings, the entire heavenly universe is astonished that we pray so little. All right, this is our last point. Now, when you see this picture, what comes to your imagination? Okay, bondage. Now, what is this specifically in the picture? This is a chain. Now, as it pertains to this experience of prayer and all of this effectualness, what do you think that this chain represents? It's a link. So what do you think links us to the Lord? Faith, yes, faith. Faith is the connecting link that links us to heaven. All right, the connecting link. Again, J.A. Wiley, notice what he says. Faith is one of the master faculties of the soul. It says it is indispensable to strengthen the purpose, grandeur of aim, and that indomitable persevering effort which guides to success. All right, notice this is from the book Education. Now, by show of hands, who here had opportunity to read that chapter, Faith and Prayer, in the book Education? By show of hands. Again, especially for a homework, I would highly encourage everyone to go through that chapter before we come back for Friday evening. This says, prayer and faith are closely allied and they need to be studied together. In the prayer of faith, there is a divine what? Science. Now, what does that word science mean? That just simply means the principles, yes, that pertain to a subject. This says, it is a science that everyone who would make his life work a success must what? So if we are going to make it to heaven at last, we must understand faith and prayer. All right, this says, he makes it plain that our asking must be according to God's will. The conditions met, the promise is unequivocal. All right, this says, it is one thing to treat the Bible as a book of good moral instruction to be heeded so far as is consistent with the spirit of the times. It is another thing to regard it as it really is the word of the living God. To hold God's word as anything less is to reject it. And this rejection by those who, who profess to believe it is foremost among the causes of skepticism and infidelity in the youth. All right, I believe that this is our last passage. Notice what this is. And, and brothers and sisters, I pray that we can really process slowly what the prophet is saying in this passage. Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with what? With God. Now, why do you think there was a distinction made between communion and real communion? Do you think that there is a difference between those two concepts? Yes, because you can commune with someone but it may not be effectual, fervent communion. Does that make sense? It says they are in too great what? In too great haste. Great Controversy says that in these last days, we need to learn how to pray long and hard. There is no other way to get around the fact that there is nothing that can make up for coming to learn uh, the ways of the Lord more perfectly than by spending time with him. Again, how much time was Jesus normally spending with the Lord, especially during his ministry in prayer? We're told that he would even frequently spend all night in prayer. He would have two, three, four hour prayer sessions with his Lord and Savior. Now, was Jesus doing this because he was trying to be self-righteous? Was he doing this because he was trying to show everyone that he was super spiritual? Was that why he was doing it? It's because he saw his need. Now, mind you, <laughs> did Jesus need God the Father the way we need God the Father? 
Did Jesus ever sin? No. no. So was Jesus praying to have victory over impatience? Was Jesus praying to have victory over, uh, over watching too many hours of Netflix? Was that what Jesus was praying over? Now, the greatest incentive that Jesus had for praying was all of the people that he was ministering to. Because he was ministering to so many souls, this is the reason why he had to spend so much time in prayer. And part of the reason why we find it so hard to agonize with the Lord is because we really don't have a lot of people to pray for. I mean, because just on average, say even if you're going through a serious trial in your life, maybe that will take maybe 45 minutes to an hour. But after that, if you're not really ministering to, to anyone, what do you have to pray for? And so as a result of that, we get up from our knees. And don't get me wrong, 45 an hour with the Lord, that, that, that's a blessing. But if we want to get the true riches out of communion with heaven, we need to be able to linger. We need to learn how to linger. All right, this says, uh, with hurried steps, they press, they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred what? When we pray, we literally enter into a sanctuary. This says, they have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With their burdens, they return to their work. These workers can never attain the highest success. Notice, they must give themselves time to think, to pray, to wait upon God for a renewal of physical, mental, and spiritual one. So sometimes when we feel tired, our, the greatest remedy is not actually sleeping, but it's prayer. But many times because we don't see prayer as a means of rest, we run to the bed instead of to our knees. This says they need the uplifting influence of his spirit. Receiving this, they will be quickened with, by what? And we'll end on this point. You know, many times, and it's so beautiful when you, when you read these experiences in the Desire of Ages, that as a result of the ministry work that Jesus was doing, his disciples and even his family thought that Jesus was going to kill himself. I mean, because he would, he would heal people for about maybe 10 hours of the day, he would barely eat anything. He would barely drink anything. He looked almost wholly emaciated, and he was constantly being oppressed by the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. And he was doing this literally day after day after day after day after day. But we're told that when Jesus would go away to the sanctuary of the mountains... And he would spend intense time with God the Father when he, would come from those, when he would come from those holy communings that the disciples would literally see the presence of God resting upon him. And all of their fears would be wholly dissipated because they knew that he had just spent time with God. Now, brothers and sisters, do you think that that experience was just for Jesus? Do you think that these experiences were just for Moses and Jeremiah and, and Isaiah and all of the patriarchs and prophets, but they're not for us? Now, brothers and sisters, we actually have to finish the work that Jesus started. So if we are going to finish the work that Jesus started, do you think that we need a very similar experience? Yes, and again, the, the appeal is just very simple. By show of hands, who here wants to say that they want a deeper experience with God specifically as it pertains to their prayer life. Amen. Because if we are properly going to have revival and reformation, we need to learn how to pray. We need to learn how to pray. And in light of that, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the experience of Christ and Ezra, these men who engaged in revival and reformation. And one of the great virtues of their reformatory experiences was this concept of effectual and fervent prayer. Father, because if we are truly going to have revival and reformation, we, we must study, understand, and practice these principles. Lord, I just pray that you would be with us as we go through the remainder of our time together, we're sad that this series is coming to an end. 
But I just pray that you would help us to be like the faithful Bereans, to go back and to study, to apply these things diligently, individually, as families, as a church family. And I just pray that even this community may be benefited as a result of, of what has taken place over these past two weeks. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I could do nothing without Him. I surely fail without Him. I would be drifting like a ship. Without him, all lost I would be. We would be. We are so happy to have this presentation this evening. Don't you say amen? And you're looking good this evening. Tomorrow evening, there will be no meeting. Then Friday evening, we are expecting a full house. Invite you to be out here to make sure you're on time because you might very well lose your seats. All right, so be out here Friday evening again for the final evening for this week's uh, presentation. And then we go into the Sabbath, a great celebration. What do you say about that? We thank those who are online. We thank you for, for worshiping with us. We don't like to say watching. Because we want you to be a part of the family. Because you are. Thank you for worshiping with us. We can't wait to see you again on Friday evening. Again, when God's manservant will have another message for God's people. Until then, we want you to drive safely home. And remember, bring a friend. Bring your pen. Bring your Bible. And come with a good spirit. God bless you. Jesus loves you. And so do I. God bless.